Hi everyone, welcome to Around the World in 80s Movies. My name is Vince Leo, I'm the author of the film review website Quipster.net. I invite you to check out over 4,000 of my film reviews in written form anytime at Quipster.net. Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R dot net. I also want to remind you that I do another podcast that covers brand new movies that are out in the theaters or sometimes on VOD. You can check out the Quipster Film Review Podcast wherever you're listening to this right now. Just do a search for it. Just remember that Quipster is spelled with a W instead of a U. Today, we're going to finally, finally get to the very end of the Nightmare on Elm Street series. It's a film that actually lies outside of the 1980s, but I'm going to extend it just because, you know, close enough, right? I just want to put a cap on this series. Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. It came out in 1991. It stars Robert Englund, Lisa Zane, Sean Greenblatt, Leslie Dean, Ricky Dean Logan, Brecken Meyer, and Yafit Kato. The film is rated R for horror, violence, and for language and drug content. The runtime is an hour and 29 minutes. The director is Rachel Talale, and the screenplay credited to Michael DeLuca. Now, this is the sixth entry in the original A Nightmare on Elm Street series. And as you can tell by the title, it promises that this would be the final one, at least of those story threads that stem throughout the first five films in the series. Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, was released into theaters. You had to have 3D glasses to put on at a certain point. New Line Cinema's first effort into the 3D realm. Although viewers would not enjoy the gimmick until the final 15 minutes, unfortunately. You got 2D all the rest of the way. We enter the realm of Freddy Krueger's psychotic mind during the 3D portion. And by that point, many people probably likely grew too impatient with the substandard fare and walked out without experiencing the Freddy vision promised from the marketing. I will say, as a personal anecdote, I was walking by the movie theater. I had no intention of seeing Freddy's Dead, but I saw that it was 3D, and myself and a friend decided to actually watch this movie. So the gimmick really did work. It got people into the theaters. Unfortunately, what we saw was not necessarily worth it, given that we didn't see 3D until the final 15 minutes of the film. Now, this one is set 10 years in the future from the last entry, specifically 1999. The previous entry was released in 1989. Even though this is a 1991 film, it's not 10 years from that. Springwood, Ohio, that's where Elm Street resides. It no longer has any of those young souls for Freddy Krueger to reap. He's killed them all. Well, that is except one, as we come to find There's one surviving teen that remains that has not been snuffed out by Freddy. And Freddy ends up planning to use him as part of this master plan to haunt the dreams beyond Springwood. He has new frontiers because every town has an Elm Street. Enter Dr. Maggie Burroughs. She's a therapist who specializes in experimental methods for analyzing dreams. She's out to help troubled teenagers. As the teens can be killed in the real world if they die in their dreams, Maggie has this hunch that Freddy can be conversely killed off from the dream realms for good if he can somehow die in the real world. And so what Maggie does not know is that she has much more of a connection to Freddy Krueger than she ever realized not becomes a part of the plot. I won't spoil it, though. Freddy's Dead explores a bit more backstory to the character of Freddy Krueger. It reveals that he was once married... And while he was married, he had actually started to kill the children of his neighborhood. He had a child of his own. And that child is shown in a series of flashbacks in which we see Robert Englund, without makeup, terrorizing his family while he makes tragedy strike for others. Now, what we also learn is how he got his demonic powers that bestowed him life beyond death. He made a pact with some serpent-like dream demons who make an appearance for the first time in this film during that 3D sequence specifically. And that allows him to inhabit the dreamscapes of others. Now, the teenagers in this film, as compared to the other films, they continue the tradition of coming from homes where the parents treat them with either abuse or neglect, although they did not end up fostering the kind of malevolence that manifested within Freddy, which he exploits to further abuse them before he ends up trying to kill them off altogether. New Line Cinema commissioned several people to try to come up with ideas on what to do with this sixth entry, Their primary attempt resulted in Peter Jackson, yes, Peter Jackson from the Lord of the Rings fame, and The Hobbit, and King Kong, and all those other movies. He was coming off of some very low-budget cult films like Bad Taste and Meet the Feebles. He was commissioned to write a script with co-writer Danny Mulherin, and to try to write the ship of the series to try to bring interest back into the franchise after the dismal performance of The Dream Child. 
They didn't write a full script, but they did come up with a plot, and that plot involved Freddy in a weakened state due to no longer being taken as a serious threat to the town of Springwood. The plot was going to involve teens intentionally entering the dream world, taking sleep pills to try to beat up on the disgraced and mostly powerless bad guy, at least until Freddy ends up turning the tables to find the strength to kill again. The title of that film was slated to be A Nightmare on Elm Street 6, Dream Lover, but it was not the direction that New Line wanted to go. They did like Jackson, and they would end up collaborating with him a decade later for the wildly successful Lord of the Rings trilogy, and the rest is history, of course. Now, where New Line eventually went was close to home. A comic book nerd and a student of series director Robert Shea named Michael DeLuca... Michael DeLuca, if you know your history of New Line Cinema, he would soon become president of production at that company. He gets his turn here to provide the screenplay. This was his first screenplay. He did write several episodes of Freddy's Nightmares for television. He also touched up the script for The Dream Child just before this one. And it was going to be directed by Rachel Talalay. This was also her first directorial effort, but she did serve as a producer for Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, and Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. All of these people, long time with the series, to try to bring the series back to the fold. There was a script that Talalay was going to direct before this that was from Michael Almereda, in which the heroine from the prior two entries, Alice, would continue on in this sixth film as a supporting character with the male lead of the film being the son that we learned about from the previous entry, The Dream Child, Jacob. He would be a 15-year-old in this film. And we would also see the return of some of the Dream Warriors from Nightmare on Elm Street 3. They were going to be Dream Police who would take on Freddy in the dreamscape to keep him from dominating. But when Lisa Wilcox was unavailable to return, plans for this direction were scrapped Rachel Talalay hated that version anyway. She preferred the script by Michael DeLuca, and she was happy to continue on with Freddy's Dead with his script at the forefront. Now, before making Freddy's Dead, Talalay had worked previously with John Waters as a producer for a couple of his films, Hairspray and Crybaby. She ended up using most of the crew from Crybaby to make Freddy's Dead, and that included bringing Johnny Depp who makes his return to the series that actually gave him his first big break in the industry in the first entry, he was on board for a short cameo. In fact, he was here not because he owed it to the series. He was here because he enjoyed working with Talalay and did it as a favor. John Waters' mainstay, Divine, was also slated to make a cameo at the beginning of this film in the airplane sequence. But unfortunately, Divine passed away prior to filming. So that didn't work out. Now, although the series has strayed a variety of ways in terms of tone and in terms of content, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, emerges as the most cartoonish in terms of how it handles the role of Freddy Krueger, who is seen putting his prey into the realm of such things as video games, or he flies around on a broom in the manner of the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz. And there's this other scene that involves Freddy cutting the straps to a parachute and then placing a bed of nails or spikes on the ground where the intended victim is sure to land. It's very much like a Roadrunner, Wile E. Coyote type thing. Now, some have speculated that the John Waters influence to Talalay, as well as the popularity at that time of David Lynch's TV show Twin Peaks, would lead to the offbeat humor that infected the production. It's definitely a lighter vibe and a lot less menacing than you would expect if you watch the first entries in this series, and even if it seems more adolescent, certainly much more willing to entertain teenagers after going for more mature audiences with The Dream Child, and that didn't work out. It is sometimes still quite graphic and gruesome in its delivery of the gore when the time comes. The film does feature a few cameos. As I mentioned, Johnny Depp is in this film for a few seconds in a PSA that is watched on television. Roseanne Barr is also in this film, and her then-husband Tom Arnold. Now, of course, they're no longer married. Alice Cooper also appears here as Freddy's abusive foster father. He's not in his traditional makeup, though, so unless you know Alice Cooper well, you probably will not necessarily recognize him, but it's kind of a treat for those people who are. The Hollywood connection would come out in full force to promote the film, too. In this odd twist, Los Angeles mayor Tom Bradley He would proclaim the day of the film's release, September 13th, 1991, as Freddy Krueger Day for Los Angeles, if you can believe that. Because the character is a sadistic psychopath who maims and murders innocent children, Bradley did receive his share of blowback from citizens groups, especially given that the city at that time was seen as having a severe issue with gang violence and definitely did not want to promote any more violent activity 
as something to proclaim and be proud of. And although this was the final film in the series and would come off of the lowest grossing film, The Dream Child, it actually would prove to be a lucrative one for New Line Cinema. It dominated the box office for the first two weeks of its release in 1991 in September. In September of 1991, although it did have pretty weak competition at the time, it pulled in nearly $35 million on a budget of about $11 million. So the 3D gimmick likely helped in that regard. As I mentioned, it sucked me into the theater to actually see this. But all I remember about it was I was not impressed. I did not remember almost anything else about the film. Oddly enough, though, New Line ended up gutting the film when it was released onto home video. It was released in theaters at about 100 minutes, but it was chopped down to about 88, 89 minutes. And that's the film that still exists today. It's not really easy to find the restored version that appeared in the theaters, although there are some international releases of this film that do have a few of the scenes that were chopped out of the American version. I don't know if it's really worth seeking out there because I remember hating this movie back in 1991. I don't think that the extra scenes helped a lot. Now, there's something to be said when even Robert Englund's feelings on Freddy's Dead is that it was the one where the series clearly jumped the shark. So take that for what it's worth. Robert Englund's a cheerleader for the entire series, but he still thinks that Freddy's Dead was pretty lame. So the film would end up being the last one in the official series, but Freddy did return again, albeit in kind of a meta fashion, out of this universe anyway. Three years later, Wes Craven's New Nightmare was released from, of course, Wes Craven, although that's set in its own reality. And despite the title suggesting that this was the final nightmare, Freddy did reappear in the crossover film from 2003, Freddy vs. Jason. So I'm not sure where in the continuity that film necessarily resides. There's some back and forth as to whether it's before Freddy's Dead or whether it comes after, but that is not my concern. I'm not going to get into Freddy vs. Jason. Talking about this one, though, I'm going to give Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, one and a half stars out of four. One and a half stars on my scale means that I do think that this is a pretty poor movie. I would only recommend it for series completists. If you're just somebody who loves Freddy Krueger and you want to watch all the films and you're not necessarily that judgmental about them, yeah, you can probably watch this and reasonably enjoy parts of it. Maybe enough of those parts would be enough for you to be satisfied as a whole. But definitely, if you're somebody who only likes maybe one or two of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, I don't think you're going to really stick around past part four unless you are that completist, unless you really do want to watch all of the films just to be able to have them done. One and a half stars goes to Freddy's Dead. Thanks everyone for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this review. As far as what I'm going to be reviewing next week, after an exhausting six films covering A Nightmare on Elm Street, I am ready to take a break from that and do something completely different, although not entirely different. This is very tangential to Freddy's Dead. I'm going to cover a film I mentioned during the course of this review from 1988, that John Waters film called Hairspray, and that will be my review on the next episode. Hairspray from 1988. If you want to keep up with the reviews, check that out before I get to my next episode. And until then, thanks everyone for joining me on this trip around the world in 80s movies. Anyway, the shun lets one break forth the fun. No hatred. The summer's almost done. No time for sleep. Jump in your jeep and pump up the fun.